welcome back everybody to another episode of the nonprofit show. It's Friday, which we all love. Oh, but more importantly, we love sharing our Fridays with the amazing Tony Bell, Mr. Nonprofit Consultancy, just focusing on fundraising. Fundraisers Friday. What a great day, huh, Tony? What a great day. I mean, I celebrate fundraisers every day, but it is really exciting uh, to be here again with you on a Friday to celebrate them on a Friday. So, on a Friday. so happy to be here. <laughs> well, we are thrilled to have you here. I think you're one of the great minds of our sector. Um, I say that all the time. I think you're such an amazing thought leader. Um, and I also love your cadence and your approach. You're very positive you're direct, but yet you're also not a hair and fire kind of person. You're like, you know, we can navigate things and it's always a very good calming presence. So today we're going to talk about navigating donor relationships long distance. And this is kind of an interesting topic um, because it's not just about folks on summer holiday. It might be new donors that you picked up that they've picked up and moved or they're coming to you from a different part of the country or community and so it's a deeper re uh, relationship discussion and i'm really excited to have you talk with us about this because um this is kind of the new reality for a lot of folks don't you think oh yeah oh for sure i mean as we talk about things as as more nonprofits engage in peer-to-peer -peer fundraising and so they see folks making contributions through peer to peer that aren't necessarily in their backyard. You know, how are they reaching out to those folks? How are they cultivating them for larger gifts? Uh, so, you know, so that's just one example of how, you know, there, there are individuals across the country supporting organizations. And, and again, how do we navigate that and how do we engage with them? I love it. Well, another thing that we really love, and, and when you talk about peer-to-peer, -peer, we have amazing sponsors, and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, 180 Management Group, Fundraisers Friday, our new Friday episode, Your Part-Time Controller, and Nonprofit Thought Leader. Again, we have these amazing co-hosts. I'm Julia C. Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. With me today, Tony Bell, Mr. Nonprofit Consultancy, one of many of the great minds that works with us. And uh, it's really an honor to be able to call upon these professionals across the country. So, okay, long distance relationships going both ways, fundraiser and donor, that's the structure. But before we jump into this, in the green room, you told me something really interesting before we got started. And I think it's a great conversation to kick us off. So will you share with us how you were preparing for today's show? Oh, oh yeah, sure, Julia. And, and you know, and 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 truly I have no ego in this work. I just want to do great stuff for great causes and support great people, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, at, at the end of the day. So I don't mind sharing as I was reflecting on today's topic um, and how my experience could add value to our viewers and listeners. I also wanted to make sure that I was in tune with things that I may not know uh, and what might be happening that no one else is thinking about. So I relied on my chat GPT and I put in a prompt just simply asking what strategies for fundraisers to maintain relationships with long distance donors. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got 11 uh, great examples of ways to do that. Most of them not too surprising, but then I said, show me more. And I got, <laughs> and I got 11 more uh, that were kind of surprising and a little unique. So, uh, so I only share that and, and so transparent about that because no longer, you know, no matter, pardon me, how long we've been in, in the sector and have been doing this work, there's always something new to learn. Um, and there's the opportunity like you and I talked about for affirmations right. about what we're currently doing. So, um, right. and I feel that way around a lot of professional development. I don't mind participating in professional development and walking away with nothing new learned, 
but a hundred percent affirmation about the work that I'm doing. Yes. So there's there's just yes. so much value in that in that affirmation. Uh, yeah. So that's what I did in, in preparation. I mean, I always prepare for these yes. conversations. You have incredible topics for us to to lean into, uh, and so that's how I engage morning and preparing for our conversation was with chat GPT and, and a few prompts and and just affirming what I know and and having some aha moments around stuff that I don't know that I can I can share with folks today. Well, I love that you did that because I think that that is, um, you know, a perfect example of how even fun development folks can be using this technology. I think a lot of us are like, oh, well, that's only going to work for operations or, oh, you know, that I'm never going to engage in that or, or whatever excuses or, or sentiments that we have. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so I love that that was a very organic thing that you did. Um, and I so I, I appreciate you sharing it because I think that's a fun way to look at something. And I'm really struck by the the word affirmation i i think that's incredibly important because i think in the fund development world a lot of times you feel isolated you know you might not have the success that you thought you were going to get that day or that week or with that donor or with that environment and then you're you know you're hesitant to go out and share that or get that feedback because maybe you think you failed or you've stumbled and so i really I really appreciate you kind of reorienting us to the value of that. Um, uh, well, I think I think I think affirmation leads to empowerment, and and a lot of of the way that I look at professional development and the nonprofit show uh, in the sector are just additional ways to empower folks in the work that they do. So I, I really feel like affirmation are kind of the foundation of empowerment. Yeah, it's really an interesting way to, to think about this and to kind of frame up what we're going to talk about. Um, let's get into this concept of phone versus video conference. Um, especially when we're dealing with folks that might might be, you know, in their in a summer location or might be traveling um, or just literally they have moved and they're or they engaged with you from a different part of the country. And yet you don't want to let that go. What are your thoughts on this? Do you see one over the other? Yeah, I don't necessarily see one over the other. I think one of the things that uh, you and I also talked about kind of leading into this topic is, is that a lot of what we're going to discuss today, really how we take a look at diversifying the way in which we communicate with all donors, whether they be local or, or long distance. We both are in markets where we have snowbirds, yes. <laughs> I think, right? Yes. You know, where oh, we have yeah. folks that you know that we both are in that in the same market with snowbirds yeah. where we have folks that are here for for a short time and adding value and then moving on you know somewhere else for the rest of the year uh so phone versus video conference i think it comes down to what we know about the donor and the way in which they want to receive information so i don't think it matters whether they're in your backyard or a thousand miles away whether it's phone versus video conference uh it really is understanding donor preference and leaning into that uh, and making sure that you honor that communication preference. Mm -hmm. uh, also though, when I think about video you know, versus phone, phone can be a little more spur of the moment. I'm gonna pick up the phone, I'm gonna call the donor and, and hopefully they'll answer. If not, I'm gonna leave them the best voice message they've ever received. Uh, you know, so that could be a little more organic and, and happen spur of the moment. Video conferencing is something that's going to require some planning and, you know, and, and some scheduling. I don't think you're just going to organically try and FaceTime. <laughs> I mean, maybe you will. I mean, if, you know, depending on your relationship. But but when I think about phone versus video, uh, those are the things that I think about is that phone is, is a little more spur of the moment, a little more organic. Uh, can happen when there's like a hot topic and and that person's totally top of mind and you want to reach out versus video, which which requires a little more communication and some scheduling ahead of time. You know, it's so funny, Tony. I had not thought of that scheduling component. 
And and that is that's like I'm so glad you said that because that is very specific to that engagement, you know, yeah. very specific. And so, um, yeah, I really appreciate you bringing that up. I also want to ask before we move on, um, do you see that this is a demographic issue? Like if you're working with older um, donors, do you see that there's more comfort in using the phone versus video or any any of that? Do you have a sense of that at all? There, I'm sure there's data out there, Julia, that that would support one versus the other that that I'm not aware of. I still just lead into the needs and desires of the individual, you know, donor. There are, you know, I'm no spring chicken, but I love, <laughs> I love engaging on video. Um, you know, I love seeing people. I love reading faces. You know, I I love all of that. Uh, yeah. in the conversation. So, uh, and, and I just think it's a little more meaningful that way. Uh, and so I, I love this technology and I love the, the ability to connect uh, face to face like this. Uh, so again, I just, I'm sure there's data that supports one versus the other uh, for me and, and, and the way that, that I like to engage with folks. I love seeing people. <laughs> yeah, I do too. And I think it's um, for me, and, and this is, also, I just, I don't know. It seems like when in the past I've made calls and I'm thinking a lot about thank you calls to donors where I didn't maybe have a relationship with them, but, and they were older. Um, it seemed like sometimes it's a little hard over the phone. And I'm hmm. wondering if a video conference call, a video call allows you to organically pick up on those facial cues and I don't know. So it's just, I think it's also changing, right? I think more we're, we're used to now these, these video conference issues aren't as, they're not as stringent as they once were, right? They're more right. natural or more organic. And um, I mean, just look at FaceTime, you know, you, you go to a supermarket and you'll be like, honey, I'm standing in front of the butter. There's so much butter. Which one do you want me to buy? Right. I mean, <laughs> And I mean, think about it. If if you go three, five years ago, that was non-existent. It wasn't happening. No, you're you're absolutely right. No, so I mean, I feel like in what you said um, is important for the here and the now. But I also think that this is one of those nuanced things that's changing, and the comfort is changing. Um, and so it's it's kind of an an interesting you know as, uh, aspect of it. Okay, well, let's, the, uh, real, real quickly, I'm sorry. The, the other thing about that, and and and, and I'm, I think I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but you know, if you are going to make the phone call, you know, in that kind of organic now moment, mm -hmm. you do need to be, you know, be prepared and have have some thought around what is my message going to be if this individual doesn't answer? Because uh, yeah. with today's technology, they'll see there's a missed call. Either, you know, if you're engaging with them a lot on, on the cell phone, they'll see your name uh, or they'll see the name of the organization uh, in a missed call. So rather than them just kind of wonder why they were calling, you know, you want to be prepared uh, to leave a meaningful message if, if you're going to engage that way. I love that you said that because I'm just thinking about myself and I'd probably be like, Oh damn, they're not there. What am I gonna say? So I, I like that you said that. I think that's like masterful, and I would expect nothing less from the amazing Tony Bell. Um, you know, let's move on to digital communication in in terms of the same thought and and working with folks, understanding all of these connecting points using technology. How do you feel about video clips? And, and using that? Well, I think video clips are awesome. I think they really help in telling a story and emote, you know, and generating an emotion. Uh, so I, I, I really like video clips. Uh, and I, I, it's an easy way to connect with a long distance donor, again, even a local donor. Uh, yeah. You're, you know, you're, you're in your brick and mortar, programs are happening. Uh, you're taking a little, you know, 30 second clip of something that's going on and you're sending it to the donor. So let's say, for example, that uh, I have decided to fund a local arts organization, but specifically 
I am funding their arts group for uh, aging adults or something, right? So that group is convening. I take a, a quick 30 second video. I send it to the donor who's specifically supporting that. Uh, and that's really showing them in real time how their investment in your organization is impacting the individuals that they intended for that to impact. Uh, so I, I think little video clips uh, are, are really meaningful, are really powerful. They don't require a video production team. No. Everything doesn't have to be green screened, right? No. I mean, you can, you can, I mean, our phones right now are, are so much more than phones uh, and, and certainly have the capacity for you to take a quick video, do a quick edit uh, if needed and, and shoot that off, you know, to a donor uh, via text or, or via email. So I love video clips. Again, I think that they help generate an emotion. And, and as we talk about affirmation, they can be really affirming to a donor uh, yeah. because they're seeing, you know, what's they're happening. Seeing. Yeah. You know, Tony, it reminds me um, last year I was working with an, uh, an organization that that serves uh, women and children in education in Africa. And um, we came up with a, a, a plan for uh, when their executive director, the U.S. executive director based here in the U.S., uh, went to Zambia. And then we identified um, like the top 30 donors that we're really, we wanted to, to cultivate even more. And we had the students do very, very quick um, video clips. And, and we had the, them say, you know, thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. I'm, you know, so-and-so coming to you from my village. And I just want to say thank you. This has really been an amazing thing that you've done. And it's changed my life. Or we're working on this or that. And um, they were sent. And people were just blown away by the concept. Mm -hmm. First of all, they had never seen the environment with which they donated to, right? Because how many of us in our lifetimes will ever go to Africa, exactly. let alone go to Africa to that point with which, to that organization that you're supporting. And then to hear their accents and to see their skin color and the fabrics that they were dressed in um, became probably one of the most successful campaigns that that this organization did and it was off the cuff i mean it was very rudimentary i mean it was literally the executive director's iphone it wasn't even a new iphone right? <laughs> right. um but very powerful and um i really i've learned a huge lesson from that it was far far more impactful than i would have ever believed i'm, I'm glad that you brought that up because that's a really good example too of, of one of the strategies around long distance donors and those are impact retreats so where you have this opportunity to bring in folks that are long distance donors together to a location where they experience the impact of what the organization is doing so impact retreats is one of those new things that i learned about today <laughs> that you know uh, that can also serve as a great a great way of of connecting and maintaining uh, your relationship with long distance donors. You know, Tony, who I think does a really good job with that is I think higher ed, the university system seems to do a really good job where they'll take, you know, the high net worth donors or funders and say, you know, we're going to go with um, a professor who explores this type of archaeology or whatever and uh, for a three day kind of educational retreat so that you can see what the experience of our students are, what the intellectual capacity and, and um, educational approach our faculty takes. Um, and I just think that's magical. I think people like to learn and experience something new. Um, not all, all of us can do it, but I think that's a really interesting model to, well, to use. When, when, when I was thinking about this topic and you and I are, are very like-minded, the folks that I thought of first that have probably the most experience in this are folks in higher ed advancement, yeah. uh, because they're you know they're they're working with with alumni across the country, uh, yeah. so they they especially 
you know, that that segment of, of our sector uh, really need to, you know, be creative and, and think of different ways to engage long distance donors. Out of yeah. all of them, I, I think of, of higher ed advancement as, as really, you know, having more of a challenge in this, in this topic than, than some others. Right. But they get it right. Cause you know, they higher ed, right. higher ed in America, man, they are the rock stars of fundraising. They get it right. And they get it right. Talk, you know, we don't talk about it enough and we don't really observe them enough, but man, they get it spot on. Um, and, I'll, I'll get your feedback before we go on to the next one of texting. I feel like they are not afraid to jump on a plane and go see somebody. What do you think about that? Oh yeah, no, no, not at all. And, and I and I think I think it's wonderful that they have the resources to be able to do that. To do that. So you know, a, a lot of times, you know, the organizations, the ones that I think about a lot of times, the small to medium sized organizations, which are my really my passion place. Uh, yeah. don't have the resources to necessarily do that. But a lot of higher ed advancement teams do have the resources to do that. And you're right. But a lot of times what, what I know of from folks in that space is that they're going to travel somewhere. They will try and coordinate an alumni event in that, yeah. you know, in that region or community that they're going to. So they'll make sure that they look at the data, see who else might be in, in that community county or zip code uh, and, you know, and, and try and maximize their time there with some type of, of convening. And, and typically alumni love getting together with other alumni. So it, it, it doesn't seem to be a, a hard sell. No. Well, and I think we could, there's, we could model that with donors where we'd say, look, you know, we're coming from uh, trying to, as you use the beautiful word convene, I love that word. Uh, convene other donors or like-minded folks, and and we're going to have somebody from the outside come and chat, or you know, as we used to say in the old days, have a coffee, um, so that you could share what's going on and what some of the recent impacts are and future plans are. So, mm -hmm. convening people and like-minded people, I think, is a great way to go. And also, too, you know, we haven't had that opportunity uh, for some time, right? There's been a lot of fear with gathering, and so. Um, this kind of an opportunity, I think people are going to be leaning into it a little bit more. I'm, and some, I'm, I'm sorry, and some folks still have fear. So again, it's understanding everyone's comfort level and 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 knowing the the individual donor. But uh, right. yeah, um, one of our things in terms of the digital communications is understanding texts and sending PDF reports. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I'm going to witness to you, and I'm I'm an older donor. Um, if, if somebody texted me, I would be like, what the hell? This is private. <laughs> I mean, and I can, I can man up and say that, but what are your thoughts about that? Because when I talk with younger, um, uh, development professionals, texting is really kind of like one of their main lines of communication. Yeah, sure. And, and so I, I think that in, in my initial communication with folks, I would say something like, feel free to reach out to me, email, phone, or text. Okay. okay. And so I kind of open it up for the donor to then kind of lead the way for me. If they text me first and I'm like, oh, right, I know that this is, you know, this is good stuff and, and they're okay with this, you know, this type of communication. Uh, so I, I am typically not the text initiator, <laughs> but I will offer text as an option when I offer ways in which uh, the donor might want to to follow up with me. Mm -hmm. um, with PDF reports, you know, that was one thing I, I was hoping we would get to is, is kind of those kind of PDFs, whether they're reports or newsletters. Uh, you know, for a while, folks were saying, oh, newsletters are, are old school and we can't do them or we shouldn't do them. I think when we talk about long distance donors, uh, a newsletter type of uh, communication is certainly valuable. Uh, we've already talked a lot today, you know, using the word impact. I would say to be a little more creative and not call it a newsletter, but call it an impact report. 
Uh, mm -hmm. So that you're sending the donor something that they, oh, an impact report. Well, that's it. something I want to see, right? Because there's going to be data, and, you know, and, and something that's going to make me feel really good about the investment that I've made in this mission. Mm -hmm. um, so I think PDFs are, are wonderful. Uh, yeah. Just, you know, again, get creative about the way you're titling them yeah. uh, and, and make sure that they're concise uh, and can add in a short period of time. <laughs> so. so you know what impact report i love that i think that's that might be my favorite thing you said today which you said a lot of great things but i think that's absolutely right because you know you want to know what your investment is doing or what your investment can do right like oh right. my gosh i can get them over the finish line or oh my gosh i could be a part of this so i'm loving that i think that's amazing um, I want to ask you, and we don't have a lot of time left, but I want to ask you about social media and that balance between getting into the donor's personal life and their personal communications. Now, when we're talking about LinkedIn, you know, there's that's more of a professional social platform. And I can see, you know, uh, opportunities there for really activating a discussion and engagement, especially with funders and your corporate donors. But how do you feel about some of this other social media engagement? Yeah, I, I think, again, unless you really know the donor, I think social media is risky uh, yeah. to call them out. Some folks are going to love it, right? Put my name on a marquee. Let everybody know that I gave you money. I mean, some folks are just going to lean into that and be like, yes, please tag me everywhere. Uh, others are going to want to be a little more humble around, you know, the fact that they've given money. And uh, and we talked once in a show about spouses and, you know, maybe I gave money and I don't want my spouse to know I gave you $100 necessarily, right? I have yeah. a chance to tell them that. But all of a sudden, it's all over Facebook or Instagram that I gave you you know, yeah. that I made a contribution. So uh, I, I think, you know, again, you have to know your donor uh, before you just start kind of tagging them in posts uh, yeah. because they, they may find it uncomfortable and, and not necessarily the type of, of visibility that they're looking for. You, it might be affirming to them, uh, but it may in fact be a little humiliating uh, to mm -hmm. them because it's not necessarily something that they want everyone to uh to see or know about and real quick quickly julia though going back to the links uh, mm -hmm. as part of like an example uh mm -hmm. i think links are really important in that they need to represent the individual so if you're going to text me or email me a link email me a link that says hey tony i just saw uh this incredible music column where because i'm very passionate about music where the individual is like rating music and they're awesome, you may love this. So mm -hmm. something that really speaks to me as an individual, not necessarily a, link, uh, necessarily a link that says, here's a new page on our website, or did you know we're doing these new programs? Here's a link to what they mean on our website. So I think if you're gonna send links to outside sources, uh, try and make sure it connects with the individual. Yeah, I like the, I, I appreciate it. I appreciate that you said that. Yeah, absolutely. Because that's that's the commonality of a relationship in our humanity. You know, we were going out to lunch with somebody. We might be like, did you see that movie or did you see the game or did you watch the Olympics or whatever? Um, so, yeah, I appreciate that you brought that up because it does um, help build that that connectivity. And and it's genuine. Right. I mean, it's, it's a genuine thing. Well, and, and it, you know, it, it supports our desire to personalize the yeah. experience and to personalize the engagement. Uh, and that sounds daunting when, you know, for organizations, when you kind of look at, you know, the, the, the number of donors for their organization, but we have to be really mindful as much as possible to personalize uh, these engagements and, and communications. Right, right. Absolutely. Well, you know, once again, you've hit a home run for us. I always am amazed at your your level of um, intention and, of course, your experience, par none, but uh, really a great way to look at this because I don't know about you, Tony, but I feel like this is that thing that is moving forward with, you know, retirement, um, work from anywhere. We have more opportunities to not be so in our communities 
for good or for bad, right? And so we've got to be thinking about this is that it's you're not just going to see somebody at the luncheon or the supermarket, right? <laughs> you're going to you're going to have to be thinking um a little bit bigger and more spread. And I also think too that it's a greater opportunity. I think a lot of times especially in smaller parts of our nation where we're like we've tapped out. We've talked to everybody. Well, we don't need to be thinking that way. We need to be expanding, you know, the geography of of, of our brains and our service. So yeah, we, we have to think local locally, but kind of act globally. I mean, we have to start thinking of ourselves as global citizens mm -hmm. and not necessarily citizens of our of our own little community. So yeah. again, I lean into you know, act locally but think globally. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I think it's it's really been a great a great conversation. You know, before we leave this wonderful conversation and and for some of us start our weekends, uh, we want to thank our partners and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, and 180 Management Group. These are the folks that are with us day in and day out. And wow, what a difference they make! All right, my friend, you've given me yet again a lot to think about. Thank you. Thank you too. You've given me a lot of think to think about, and uh, and thank you for always making me feel like what I have to say is relevant and and makes a difference. So that that means a lot. Thank you. You know what? It's easy because it's true. It's true. You always give me really great things to think about. And I, as I said at the start of the show, I like your tenor. I mean, you. I always feel like I can say anything, and you're not gonna, you know. Cat, your hair is not going to catch on fire, but you will gently um, teach me or move me to a new idea or phraseology. And so I appreciate that. Um, and so that's a cool thing. Hey, everybody, we end each and every episode with this mantra. And it goes like this to stay well so you can do well. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>